Welcome, everybody. My name is Julianne Peterson. I welcome you to tonight's Zoom at 8. And as you know, we are uh, coming to you live from the studios of Zoom at 8 with a really, really special guest, Neil Bala. Uh, I'm with Old Capital. I'm a commercial loan officer, and we are a different type of lender. We are a relationship lender. We will help you not only get the deal done, but we'll also help you find and, uh, and, and supply you with lo uh, limited partners, with general partners, with your attorney, with your insurance broker, and potentially with a broker on the real estate side. So we are really looking for opportunities where we can partner, not only just for the debt, but all the other parts of the relationship. And it is important. This is not just about saving you a quarter percent. This is about the education that Old Capital puts out there. And, and we really do welcome you to our Old Capital family. Uh, you know, I, we started this over a year ago. And I, I have to tell you, I've said it before, I'm just so grateful that Zoom is at our fingertips. We have grown our business tremendously. We started out with about 12 people, and tonight we have opened this up to over 100 people. So I'm looking forward to continuing to build our relationship with you. I open this up so that you can meet people to build relationships and really hope that Old Capital can bring you to the finish line. Thank you. All right. Well, I think it's a great time to go ahead and push over Neil Bawa. He is a technologist. If there is somebody in the house that is, does not know who Neil is, you are up for a real treat tonight. Um, he is universally known. Neil is universally known in the real estate circle as the mad scientist of multifamily. Besides being one of the most in-demand speakers in the commercial real estate, Neil is the data guru a process freak, and an outsourcing expert. Neil treats his $250 million uh, multifamily portfolio as an ongoing experiment in efficiency and optimization. The mad scientist lives with two mantras. His first mantra is, we can only manage what we can measure. And his second mantra is, data beats gut feeling by a million miles. These mantras and a dozen other uh, d disruptive beliefs drive profits for his 300 plus investors. Neil serves as a CEO and founder of Grow Capitalist, which is an icon uh, iconic uh, data-driven commercial real estate investment company. He loves public speaking, as you will get to see, and he is energetic and a humorous speaker. He also serves as a CEO at Multifamily U, an apartment investing education program. I highly recommend this. If he doesn't talk about it, I will. Over 5,000 students attend his multifamily seminar series each and every year. And hundreds attend his Magic of Multifamily boot camps. He is a backyard tomato farmer. I've never met one of those. And a protein diet nut, uh, health nut. He believes in positivity and karma. Neil is passionate about the sport of cricket, which I've never played, and about the enormous potential of self-driving electrical vehicles to solve the global uh, climate crisis. Neil, I thank you so, so much for being here. I feel like I've made it. We are so honored to have you join us. We have opened up our, as I mentioned, our audience to over 100. So I'm, I am thinking we're going to get there. It's still early. There we go. All right. Thanks so much for that introduction, Julie. Um, one, one piece that I, I think wasn't mentioned that I wanted to point out is that we are actually developers first and syndicators next. Uh, we are 18 syndications old, about 350 million investor capital. Right now, now we have five investors that are currently invested. Um, we're actually doing more development at this point than syndication. And I think every one of you in this room knows why. I see a lot of budding syndicators. I see a lot of people that I know, um, but I see a lot of people that are first, second, third time syndicators. And you know what's happening in the marketplace. You know that value add in some ways is becoming an oxymoron because now you have 
nine years into a cycle, you have properties that have been sold and then sold again, and now they're still selling them as value at third time. And obviously, that's not that's not universal. There's clearly you know lots and lots of nuggets out there. People are still making generating money. But I wanted to share something with you here that is a slightly scary thought. But I think that one of the things that I do is the reason I'm called the mad scientist is I never hesitate in saying things that people are afraid of saying because they want to be either politically correct or they don't want to break someone else's bubble because that's bad. Bad things happen when people don't discuss how our reality is changing. Okay, Mm -hmm. so here's something that I want to share with you that you haven't heard before. And this is for syndicators only or budding syndicators. Did you know that more than 80% of the money that your investors, that syndication investors made in the last 24 months came from cap rate compression? You know what that means, right? If cap rates stop compressing, then 80% of the profit that your investors are making vanishes, gone. It's not there. It doesn't exist. And did you know what this number was in 2011? It was 20%. So we've come a very long way in this cycle where in 2011, the average investor was making 80% of his money from cash flow because there wasn't capital appreciation in 2011 in multifamily. Not until 2013 did you really start seeing that. And so people were making money what I consider to be the right way. They were making money from cash flow because that's what you pitch multifamily as. It's cash flow. They were making that money. Rents were going up. Cap, Cap rates weren't compressing. Right. As rents went up, people did make money because of because of simply the NOI going up. But today, what's happening is cap rates are compressing. And as a cap rates compress, investors are making money off of that. So but one question that I have for everyone that's watching, right? Some of you are more experienced than others. People like Jim Biggs are pretty expen- experienced. The question that Jim Biggs has to ask himself is, what if one day cap compression stopped? Right? What if you get went to the point where it was either flat or it went up. And I'm not talking about some gloom, doom scenario. What if caps went up half a point? How would that affect your investors? How would that affect your investments? That's a question that I think everyone should be asking themselves because we are in the 10th year of this cycle. So that's the first thought that I wanted to share with you. Um, you know, you, you know quite a bit about my, my portfolio. The reason we started doing new construction is two reasons. One is, A long time ago, a very wise person told me this. In a seller's market, try and be a seller, right? I mean, it sounds very obvious. In a seller's market, try and be a seller. But what most of us are doing these days is we're buying assets. So I'm trying very hard to be a seller. What's the best way for me to be a seller is to construct my own assets, create my own value. And so a lot of people think value add creates value. Actually, the greatest value of all in real estate is to go from dirt to beautiful brand new building. That's many times the value that can be created. So I found in new construction that I'm able to create much more value and have it be much less dependent on things like cap rate. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm creating an enormous amount of value. So my need at this point is that if any of you are seeing new construction projects. I know that vast majority of you don't play in that world and I know it it requires an incredible amount of competency and and skill, send them to me. So that's my need from you as, as I go through this presentation. I have one other need that I think that many of you can benefit from without getting off of whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, Lots of you are looking for investors. I'm not, I, I don't need investors per se. A lot of you are looking for investors. And when you talk with investors, they say something like, I'm not so sure about syndication or syndication is not my thing, or I just want to own my own assets. I'd love for them, those kinds of investors to be introduced to me because one of the products that I sell, it's a product, not a syndication, is that I build fourplexes, beautiful brand new fourplexes, lots of them in Texas. I build them in San Antonio. I build them in Houston. I build them near universities in in Texas, so the UT Texas system. And I'm selling those and I'm looking for buyers of those. And of course, those are 1031 capable, which of course is a syndication issue, right? You know, how do you 1031 into it? So I'd love to talk with you. If you have people that are interested 
in putting money and they don't want to you know, get into a syndication, get out in three years, five years, seven years. I'd love to talk with you about that because I think that there's an exit for those people and a way for you to make money in a very straightforward process. You know, I'm not asking you to really spend a lot of time on it. Five minutes is about the amount of time that I'm looking for you to spend on it. So that's a message that I wanted to give you. Now, with syndicators, especially new syndicators, a lot of you guys, like you know, folks like Jim, who's been, who've been doing it for a while, this may not come as big news for you, a lot of properties that are selling today are actually what is left over. So the best properties went in the 2011 to 2014 timeframe. And then the 14 to 16, 14 to 18 timeframe, you had the next set of properties. And then 18 onwards are the properties that nobody could sell before that because they had so much negative equity or they were so messed up that nobody wanted to buy them. The average age of the syndicated property is increasing. So, you know, when we started doing syndication in 2013, everyone was buying either 80s or 90s properties. And then we were buying 80s and 70s. And now I'm seeing syndication properties that are in the 60s, right? So the question is, your risk is clearly increasing. You've got, a, you know, you're, you're all living off of cap compression. That's a risky thing. You are all buying older properties and that's a risky thing. So what are the sort of tools that you could have to figure out how to still make a lot of money for your investors? How do you game the system, given that there's not much you can do on the price? The price is what it is. The market's really, you know, frothy. There's not much, despite a pandemic, obviously property prices have not gone down. So how do you game the system? I can tell you how I have gamed the system, okay? I've always believed that regardless of what I tell my investors, the real value that we provide is in picking markets where cap rates continue to compress. And you might say, but you're just talking about cap rates increasing. Yes, but that doesn't happen throughout the US. At the same time, in a normal market, there are markets where cap rates are going down and markets where cap rates are going up. And what is really useful is to invest in markets where cap rates are going to decline in the next five years. That's what I mean by gaming the system. You don't change anything else. Everything that's being taught to you, you keep doing. You do the due diligence. You, do the make sure, you make sure you're doing asset management. None of that changes. But gaming the system allows you to exit in a market that has significantly lower cap rates than when you enter it. And combine that with tertiary markets. So one of the key things I'm known for is for my incredible support for tertiary markets. A lot of people, and I mean true tertiaries, a lot of people think a tertiary market is like McKinney in Dallas. McKinney is in tertiary. It takes 20 minutes to drive from Plano to McKinney. That's not a tertiary market, right? I mean detached tertiaries. I mean a tertiary that doesn't have a, a secondary within 100 miles of it, right? So obviously nobody can commute 100 miles. That's what I mean by tertiaries. I'm known for my support of tertiaries. What's a detached tertiary today? Jacksonville. Tucson, um, St. George. These are detached tertiary. You have to drive more than 100 miles before you get to any place. I believe that the money to be made is in tertiaries, but tertiaries are, are riskiest, right? So obviously you know this already, they're riskiest. So uh, what happens is when I talk with people about tertiaries, the first thing that I say is tertiaries are risky. All right, and oranges are orange. Just saying stuff that you've heard 20 times doesn't mean that you are actually applying intelligence to it. Aren't cap rates compressing? Doesn't that mean multifamily is more risky? Aren't you paying up for properties compared to what you used to pay two or three years ago? Doesn't that mean risk is increasing? The truth is risk is increasing in everything. The question is, what is the relative risk? What is the relative risk between a tertiary market, which probably only has like one type of job, maybe some, some of them are more diverse, and a primary or a secondary where you're paying at the very top of the market. Think about it. In some ways, aren't tertiaries better? And this argument is not a new argument. It's not a post-COVID argument. Obviously, post-COVID tertiaries make more sense. But pre-COVID, I was putting my money where my mouth is. My property in Dalton, Georgia, my most profitable property, you know, it's going to be a 60 plus percent annualized exit. Dalton is 40 miles from Chattanooga, which in itself you could argue is a tertiary, right? If not, at least Chattanooga is a, a secondary, but it's 40 miles away. My property in um, you know, Tucson is about 100 miles away from Phoenix or a little more than 100 miles away. I then have other properties that are nowhere close. My newest 
metro that I'm investing in, and the biggest investment of my life is going to this metro because I'm investing millions of dollars of my own money, is in a true tertiary called Idaho Falls. And I believe Idaho Falls to be simply the greatest market in the United States, period, right? Of any kind, primary, secondary, tertiary. And you might say, why the heck is he saying stuff like that? I've never heard of Idaho Falls. And today I'm gonna to teach you a system that allows you to find places like Idaho Falls. And I can tell you this, you can screw up 16 different ways your investment in Idaho Falls and you probably still make 20% for your investors. Why? Because that is a true all ships rising market. And there's so few of them today. So few. So it just, there's so many challenges. Yes, there's markets like Phoenix that are rising, but aren't you paying up like crazy? So think about this. And Idaho Falls is not a market for those of you that are in the 100 plus unit range, but there's plenty of you that are still buying 30, 40, 50, 80 units. It's a market for you guys. Bottom line is today we have to look at true tertiary markets. And the biggest problem with true tertiaries is you don't know which ones are better than others. And so it, there's a system that I invented six or seven years ago called the real focus system. I'm gonna teach you a modified version of it today. That's for syndicators, right? So it's obviously everything that I'm gonna show you today works for a investor. But I think more than that, I'm gonna show you the stuff that works for either syndicators or aspiring syndicators. Let's get started. All right, the real focus system, currently there are about 10,000 people taking the real focus course in lots of different places. It's been used to buy or build all of the properties that you see on the screen. This is exactly 50% of my database, of, of my, sorry, of my portfolio. And as you can see, I do new construction in places like Dalton, Georgia. You've never heard of the carpet capital of the world because there's no reason why you would hear of it unless you used a system like this. You've never used, heard of a town named Woods Cross. I built industrial there and everything is already pre-leased even the, before I've built it. So I've actually exited the project before I start construction. That's the value of having a data-driven system like the one that I'm going to show you today. So two cents from a law, my, my lawyer, we're not investment advisors. Investments involve different degrees of risk. You're free to accept or reject investment recommendations. Recommendations are not guarantees. Do not invest your money on our recommendation alone. That's it. Let's get started. The first piece that I want to tell you, when you want to, to invest into a bubbly market, look at population growth. Really, really look at population growth. I know there's people making money by investing in Louisiana. I know there's people investing in, in markets that are very slow like Mississippi. I would urge you not to do that because the numbers there do not look as good as you think they do. The truth is you need population growth for cap rate compression. You need population growth for there to be increase in NOI and increase in rent. But how much population growth? Well, here's my belief. You need 21.25% population growth in a city, right? That is between 250,000 and a million people. Notice that I've sliced and diced this. So if the city is smaller than 250,000, you need more population growth. Why? Because you're taking a bigger risk. If the city is a typical US city, which tends to be between a quarter million and a million people, then you want this much population growth, 21.25 between 2000 and 2017. And you might say, wait a minute, I'm in 2020. I'm at the end of 2020. Why is he showing me data that's three years old? And the answer is this data is available for free. Okay, and I can tell you, I have paid, I pay for a humongous amount of data from six different sources. And I can tell you that even if I was to apply this system between 2000 and 2020, the current year, I'm going to end up with the same list of cities. Why? Because cities don't change over years. They change over decades. So unless Amazon plops a headquarters in or a Hurricane Katrina smashes through a city, they don't change over years. They change over decades. That's why use the free data. And at the end of the presentation, I'll tell you how to buy the data if you're a fanatic about that. But trust me, you're gonna end up with the same list of cities. So 2000, 2017, 21.25% is the population growth. If the city is very large, then this is the growth. Like a city at the size of Phoenix, 15% is good enough. If the city is micro growth, like St. George, Utah or Durham, North Carolina, then you're looking for 30% growth in this time frame, right? And then each year, you're gonna change this number. So in 2021, I want you to add one and a quarter to, to this number. Do you see this number here? 21.25, add one and a quarter to this number next year. 
Make sense? So let's let's find out how do we use this, right? So, okay, where do I get this population data? Well, it's really simple, actually. If you go, all you're doing is you are going to Google, right? So google.com and you're typing in population space. I'm gonna use my, my well-known, uh, you know, city, that demo city, and that's Columbus, Ohio, right? So you type in population, you don't need the word search, so just population Columbus, Ohio, you get this nice graph. This graph by itself can make you rich, just this graph. Most people don't understand that there's a huge difference between cities in the same state. Look at this, graph. three cities, Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati, all in Ohio. Ohio is not a growth state. They get a little bit of population growth, but it's not, no one ever thought of Ohio as a growth state. As a result, prices there are comparably lower than other places. But can't you see just by looking at the screen that one of the cities in Ohio is a growth city, right? Clearly a growth city. And that city has had growth. It's nothing new. It's not like, oh, in the last three years, Columbus became a growth city and I didn't know about it, it's too late. Nonsense. Look at the damn screen. Columbus has been growing since 1990. This secret is visible to anyone that knows how to use Google. And there are people paying the same amount per unit in Cleveland and Cincinnati as they are in Columbus, the same amount. And again, I'm not saying that those people in Cleveland and, and Cincinnati are losing money. They're clearly not, they're making money. But you know what they're not doing? They're not using what is known as tailwind. So Cleveland and Cincinnati have headwind. And you know what that headwind is? No population growth. So when you're buying something there, you're, you're giving yourself a headwind. You're making your job much simpler. The person that's buying the same asset in Columbus for pretty much the same price, maybe $5,000 a door or more, has tailwind. It's a 100 mile an hour tailwind. Their plane's gonna fly much, much faster. So how do I use the data again, right? So I gave you an algorithm. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you an Excel spreadsheet that goes with that algorithm. So let me open the Excel spreadsheet. By the way, this Excel spreadsheet is going to be given to you at the end of this presentation. So you don't need to write anything down. So the PowerPoint deck that I'm giving you, Excel spreadsheet, they're, they're all going to be with you. And let me open it. Somebody I forgot to open it before. All right, so here's the Excel spreadsheet that you're gonna end up with. You need two numbers, population in 2000, population in 2017. I think it just switched to 2018. So these are the two numbers. You notice I plugged them in. Where did I find them? Go back to that blue chart. Mouse over the, the most recent number. So you see Columbus, 892,533 people in 2018. Now go back, 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 back. Go all the way to 2000, 714,984. Two numbers, right? Plug those numbers in to the Excel spreadsheet that I just showed you. Plug one here, plug one here. Population growth, 25%. Remember, it had to be 21.25%, right? And then you had to add one and a quarter because the year has changed here. Remember, this is now 2000 to 2018 because Google has now started showing you 2018 data. See, whoops, where was the page that I was just on? There, here it is. So now notice that when you mouse over, this now says 2018, it doesn't say 2017. So you have to add that one and a quarter percent and so you need to be right around 22.5% and you're at 25%. So Columbus gets a thumbs up on population tailwind. That tailwind is going to give you profits because here's a prediction. There's an extremely high chance that five years from now, Columbus's population will be 11 or 12% higher. There's an extremely high chance that Cleveland's population is going to be 2% lower five years from now. Which one do you think is gonna make you more money? All right, that's population growth. Let's look at median household income. You want to have 31.5% median household income growth between 2000 and 2017 to pick your cities, okay? Or your micro cities or your tertiaries. Remember, I'm telling you that now is the time to invest in tertiaries. And that was pre-COVID. Post-COVID, obviously, they make all the sense in the world with people moving away from San Francisco. The, the area that I live in, San Francisco, is losing a massive amount of population per month for the last eight months. So income growth is a key driver when you're looking at a tertiary that you've never heard of and you're scared to go in there. Look for this kind of income growth. Once again, between 2000 and 2017, where do you get this data? Citydata.com. What do you do next year? You add one and a quarter to that number next year. Now, 
Where do you get the data from? CD data. I'm going to click on this link. Whoops, sorry. I'm going to go open CD data, and I'm going to plug in my favorite city. Well, not a favorite city. It's just favorite for examples. Just so you know, Columbus, Ohio is not my favorite city. It's just nice for examples, right? It's ni nice Midwest, mid-sized city. I like that. All right. So I plugged in Columbus, Ohio into city-data.com. And then right here, I see estimated median household income in 2017. That's a number. It was this number in 2000. I've got a number here. I've got a number here. I've got an Excel spreadsheet. I plug in the numbers here. And it says, the spreadsheet says 36% growth in income. How much did we need? Well, we needed 31 and whatever, right? We're not adding the 1.25% yet because city data is showing 2017 data, it's showing 2018 data. So we needed about 31, 32%. And this has basically a 36% increase in income. I can tell you the numbers for Cleveland look as good. The numbers for Cincinnati, would not look as good. You, are you beginning to see how you're creating tailwind for yourself that's going to push your property upward in price, right? The third rule, the third real focus rule says that, oops, number three, right there, is that you want to go into a city with house and condo values increasing by 42% in that time frame. And you might say, wait a minute, I am a multifamily guy, dude. Well, did you know something? As a multifamily guy, you have an 18-month crystal ball. It's an 18-month crystal ball. In any city where home prices spike, spike, not increase, but spike, multifamily rents will spike in 18 months. Check that out. Go back, run a statistical scenario on 50 cities, and you'll notice it. You have a crystal ball. But that crystal ball only works by following single-family home prices. Why? And a lot of people are like, what do single family home prices have to do with multifamily? Simple. Each month, a certain number of people that were going to be ho homeowners fall out of home ownership because home prices go up faster than income. Their income's going up 3%, home prices are going up 6%, they can't afford it anymore. And because they've been chasing that dream for years, guess what they do when they finally say, I have to stay a renter? They get the best rental unit they can. That means that they're going to go in for your rehab units. You don't care about renters who want non-rehab units because your business plan only works on renters that go after rehab units. And cities that have high home price increases create a lot of those people. They create a massive number of renters that want the best unit they can get because their dream of home ownership got crushed. Does that make sense? So now, you want to go to city data and make sure that the city that you're going in, that tertiary market that you've never heard of, you want to make sure that it has 42.5% income growth. So now in my case, I'm going to go to Columbus. And this was where we were at a moment ago. Go down two inches. And now you'll see, um, <coughs> sorry, um, there. Estimated median house or condo value in 2017. So here's the price in 2000. Here's the price in 2017. You have two numbers. Grab the numbers. Go back into Excel. Plug them in it. And boom, you need it to be at 41.5%. You're at 53%. This market is going to give you the tailwind for cap rates to compress and prices to go up in your five-year time. Make sense, right? All right, number four, is, number four is crime, but it's not crime, it's reduction in crime. So it took me a long time to figure that one out. I write, as you can imagine, I ran statistical analysis on 3,000 cities. And crime levels didn't seem to correlate with profits for syndicators. But what correlated was a change in crime levels. So you want to be in a city where crime goes below 500, OK? And, and crime is going down. So crime is going down, and the number is below 500. Now, here's something that you should know this. As a syndicator, if you're looking at a true tertiary, this number does not work. This number only works for primaries and secondaries. So write down, I'm not giving this to you in, in, in the deck, the crime number that you need on city data for a tertiary market is 300, 300, not 500. 500 only works in primaries and secondaries. Where do you get the data? city-data.com. So I'm gonna go to city-data and I'm gonna plug in 
I'm going to go down a little bit further. There's this blue table that's going to show up. You see this? Prime rates, blue table. I'm going to ignore this whole table. I'm going to ignore the murders, the rapes, the robberies, the, the assaults, the burglaries. I don't care about that. I only care about the index in blue. See this index? Here it shows me that Columbus was actually a pretty high crime place in 2005. But in the last 13 years, crime has declined continuously, very smoothly declining to now being at 375, which is a pretty awesome number for crime. I can tell you that not a lot of Midwestern cities would come anywhere close to 375. So not only do you see low crime in Columbus, you see declining crime and you see a consistent decline in crime. And that's what you're looking for. So secondaries, this number has to be below 500. And this number has to be higher than this number. Why? That means crime is declining from left to right. Up tertiary, you're looking for 300. All right. And then the last one is jobs, which is especially difficult. So I'm giving you the new syndicator method for job growth, because guess what? There are exactly, there's exactly one market out of 3,000 in the United States that has job growth. One. Anybody guess what that one market is? I mentioned it earlier on in this presentation. Idaho Falls. That's right. The one market in the United States with job growth at this point in time is Idaho Falls. If you, if you don't know what's happening there, just Google INL, right? The, the Idaho Labs National Laboratory. So there's something bizarre going on there, creating job growth during a pandemic, but every other city in the US has job losses. So I'm gonna show you how to figure out job growth in the middle of a damn pandemic, okay? But before I do that, before I do that, here's my one minute pitch for you. One of the things I love doing is teaching. I enjoy teaching, I enjoy aha moments. And so I help people with teaching them about apartment building. Some of you have already taken courses and you'll find that my course is very unique. Number one, I'm not pitching the $30,000, you know, kind of um, programs. I simply teach a boot camp. it's $3,000, and it teaches you technology-driven, data-driven investing. So it's very specific in its niche. It's very specific. And all of you guys know that when you go to these, you're going to get pitched for some $30,000, $50,000 product. You won't get pitched here. And my training is very specific. Everything that I just taught you, imagine that going on for 18 hours, right? Step by step. Finding a property, here are steps. Um, you know, man asset managing a property, here are steps. Hiring virtual assistants, here are steps. Building an army in the Philippines to raise your rents, here are steps. Everything is given to you in a very step-by-step -step process, and that's what my bootcamp is. The second promise is I have no upsell. I never sell you on anything besides the bootcamp. When you come in, I make a promise, I raise my hand, and I say, for the next 18 hours of instruction, I will not pitch anything. I just simply will teach you what you need to know. So I make that promise now and I will make it then. And the third promise is it's filled with shortcuts. One of my 56 shortcuts is being discussed today. But the second part of that shortcut is how do I identify neighborhoods within the cities that I'm buying in? That's in the bootcamp and only in the bootcamp. Secrets like Virtual assistants. I know, I know many of you know this. I have 19 full-time virtual assistants and nine employees in the US. So 28 people in my org, 19 of them. And many people in that org say, even the Americans say that the VAs are actually more productive than them. That entire process of how to make VAs productive is discussed in the bootcamp in detail. So if you're if you're interested in a lower cost bootcamp that's technology fueled, check out multifamilyu.com slash bootcamp. We're in super early bird, so you can save a thousand bucks. As you can imagine, it's done by Zoom. And a lot of people might say, I don't enjoy the Zoom experience. You're gonna love this Zoom experience because we started in Zoom. For the first two years that we ran this bootcamp, it was only available over Zoom. So we actually structured it as an online experience. All right, done with pitch, back to um, presentation. 12-month job growth number. 
you want to go into cities, especially tertiary cities with job growth at 2%, you'll find that actually tertiaries grow faster than secondaries. So 2% is not going to be terribly difficult to get, except today where only one city in the US has job growth, right? So how do you figure out today, how do you figure out where the job growth is in the middle of a pandemic? Well, there's a couple different ways of doing it, and I'm gonna show you my favorites. There's this link, departmentofnumbers.com slash employment slash metros. Now, the one thing that I want you to do is you don't have to write this down because I'm gonna give you an Excel spreadsheet that's gonna have this link in it, right? So if you go to this link, and I'm gonna go there now, it shows you job growth numbers in the US. Now, it doesn't show you every single city, and I can also tell you how you can find it for a city that's not in this list. Um, no, no, just, what am I doing? Doing something wrong here. Uh, Department of Numbers, there we go. All right, so here is this list and you can see lots of cities in here, right? Lots and lots and lots of cities, even small cities like Mount Vernon or Virginia Beach, lots of tiny cities are in this list. Now, as you can imagine, when I go here and I sort this one year job percent change, the worst cities are in, in Louisiana, Lake Charles lost 20% employment over the last year. Ocean City, New Jersey is a gambling hub, lost 17%. Honolulu lost 16%. This all makes sense, right? This completely makes sense today. Now, cities in terms of job gain, well, now we've got a few. There we go. We've got a number of them that are growing at this point in time. Just so you know, Idaho Falls doesn't show up in this list because it's too small. So that the the list that I use is on the Bureau of Labor Statistics website. I'm just giving you an easier one. I wanted you to start with one that was a bit easier, but the BLS gives you 3,300 cities and it takes a while to kind of sort through their site. So I'm giving you this one. I can tell you Idaho Falls would have a significantly higher number than Champaign, Illinois. So going back, looking at this list, you go, well, this list is, is, is not gonna work because, you know, Right here, he said 2%. The only city in the US that has more than 2% is Champaign. So should we all go to Champaign? The answer, the answer is no. Obviously that's not what I wanted you to do. So here's what I want you to do today. When you're looking for tertiary cities and there's tons of them here, I want you to look at where the tertiary cities job growth was in February before the pandemic started. Because what I am seeing is practically every city is returning back to the norm. Some are taking a little bit long, longer, some are taking a little bit shorter, but they're returning to the norm. The norm being their Feb unemployment rate, okay? Now there's an exception to this rule and you should know it. Cities like Las Vegas, Orlando are taking much longer because they were international travel hubs. They were not domestic travel hubs, they were international travel hubs. So skip those cities, but otherwise cities are returning back to their Feb levels. Now you might say, where the heck am I going to find Feb numbers, right? That's like eight or nine months ago. This site doesn't have those numbers. Let me let you into a secret. There's a website which indexes the entire web. It makes a copy of the web and it is called the Wayback Machine, Wayback Machine. So you go to the Wayback Machine, you click on it and the website opens. Now what you do is you go back to this, this URL. Remember this URL that we were on? That's showing us the 1% job change, right? You're gonna grab that URL and you're gonna to go to the internet machine and you're gonna plug that URL in here and say, give me older versions, Wayback Machine. And now you're gonna notice that this website is showing you a version in April, April 21st. And you might say, ah, the pandemic started in March. Why are you showing me April? Well, that's because job data in the US is about a month and a half old. If I click on this link on April 21st, it's gonna take a few seconds. When it loads, you're gonna notice this is February 2020 data. This is very powerful because now I go sort here and sort here, and now I can see some incredible tertiaries. Why is Yuba City at 8% growth? Well, the fires, have you heard of the fires, right? Yuba City is where the labor is coming from to rebuild those thousands of homes. So that makes a, a lot of sense. And not, not this year's fires, I mean last year's fires. Kennewick, Washington, 
Where's Kennebec, Washington? It's in the Tri-Cities area. It's 150, 175 miles from Olympia. What's happening there? They have a nuclear reactor that just got approval until 2064, and there's a lot of growth. That's the story. St. George, Utah, my favorite one in this list, absolutely the favorite one in this list. What's happening in St. George? It's the only warm place in Utah. And Utah has been the fastest growing state in the union for three straight years. It's the only warm place. Where do rich Utahns go to retire? They go to St. George. Boise. Boise has been the fastest growing city in America for almost two years, right? Incredible, incredible places that you see here on this list that you would have never heard of. Provo, Utah. Two years ago, I built a $100 million project here. Um, I've, I've built a 118 unit in St. George. I've purchased in these markets. Incredible, incredible power. And again, there's some here that you all know about. Austin and Jacksonville and Phoenix and Dallas. They're in here. They're superstars. What's the problem? Cap rates. What's the problem? You're overpaying. But there's lots of places here where you might not be overpaying. Tennessee is going through a rejuvenation. Nashville is creating all ships rising. Clarkville, Knoxville, Chattanooga. These are the markets that you don't know about that are super powerful. As a syndicator, it's your job to know this. Look at the job growth here, right? All of you guys are thinking, wow, this is amazing job growth. And it is. This is a small market, but it has phenomenal job growth. It has even more job growth than Nashville. And you have heard of Nashville there before. Madeira, California, 3.11%. Guess how many properties I have in Madeira? 13. 13 properties in Madeira. Because I know these things, and I've been tracking this for 10 straight years. So ignore the big shots, like Seattle, and then look at Fort Collins. Denver is expensive, but Fort Collins is 65 miles north of Denver, and an all-ships rising effect is underway. Look at that. Look at College Station. There are so many markets. And you might say there aren't enough properties there. So what? Invest in three tertiaries and get six properties in, instead of investing all in Phoenix or all in Houston or all in Dallas like you guys are doing. And I, I'm positive that your returns are going to be massively greater in all of these places. So those are my five real focus rules. Come to my boot camp and I'll give you the five uh, rules for neighborhoods inside of these cities. You can get the Excel spreadsheet and this PowerPoint deck. Here's all the different ways. You can text this word to this number. You can use this barcode, or you can just go directly to this URL. Any one of those three will give you the, the, the five city rules and will get you the Excel spreadsheet that has the rule list again. So check that out. And uh, if you have questions, especially regarding smaller metros, specific metros, I'm happy to answer those. I see some interesting comments, so I'll point that out. Melanie has it right. It's nuclear batteries and small nuclear reactors that are, are creating the Idaho Falls effect. The United States is now working on tiny nuclear reactors. They're being built in Idaho Falls. Hmm. Um, and then Chris and, and Yimi said, they are in St. George. Crime rates are sub 170. That is right. St. George has extraordinarily low crime rates. And Victor said he is in Madeira, California. That's right. You know, you know, shut down. So problems there right now, Victor, but I think that they will go away next year. All right. Uh, let's see. There was a question for you about yep. um, the wood, your, the cost for uh, lumber. Okay. on some of these areas? Yep, so the, the answer is the cost of lumber is up 50%. But some people have started thinking that means construction cost is going to go up 50%. No, construction cost is going to go up six or 7% if the cost of lumber goes up 50. Because do you think lumber is the only cost? So a lot of people, this is once again, one of those mindsets where people are like, oh, lumber is expensive, I'm not gonna build anything. But there are 50 million things that you buy in a home. You buy windows, you buy doors, you, you buy concrete, you do framing, you do landscaping. All of these are costs. One cost is up, lumber, 50%. Here's the good news. I called a lumber company in, in, in Canada because I was getting hurt with my, with my new construction. I said, is this gonna stay up? He said, no, Neil, it's complete and utter price gouging. 
all of the all of the different places are open in six months you're going to be at the same price well the thing is if you're listening to me in december what is the chance that you're actually going to be building something in less than six months zero right by the time you get to construction lumber prices will be down so they've affected some of my projects and and we've seen a price inflation of six or seven percent but at the same time in the markets that I'm in, we've seen a cap compression of over 30%. So we'll take six with 30. Neil, uh, Madeira, it's in California. Uh, it's not a tenant friendly state. Nope. What is your thought on that? Um, I bought you know, my properties in Madeira when this system was developed in 2008. Madeira was the, the hardest hit of all 3000 cities in the US, so I bought there. So I'm at this point looking to exit. I would not recommend that any syndicator that's listening to this today buy property in California. California at this point is scorched earth. Do not do it. You've got so many choices. You, most of you guys live in the Southeast. Why in God's name would you deal with California's nonsense? That's a good point. Right? If you live in Madeira, maybe. If you don't, then... Um, you know, this is, this is not something that you want to do. So Camille had a good question. What does boots on the crown and developing your network look like for tertiary markets? Well, it looks like any other market. You want to see how I develop my network, right? So here, uh, let me, hopefully you guys have already, you know, plugged this information in. I'll bring it up in a second, but I want to show you how I develop it. So I do two, two day runs. So I, I just finished a run in Idaho Falls and let me go to drive.google.com. And this, this looks like a new construction run, by the way. Um, so I do, I do two different kinds of runs, value add runs, new construction run. I show you one for new construction. So here, Idaho Falls. And so these are all the people that I've sourced there. I've sourced all of these people remotely. I didn't go to Idaho Falls to source them. But when I did go to Idaho Falls, here are the people that I met. So this is the date, October 9th on day one. I met between 1 p.m. because I, I flew into Salt Lake City, so it took me until one o'clock to get to Idaho Falls. From here to 9.30, I was meeting with people. These are all the people I was meeting with, land brokers, uh, builder, broker, lender, uh, builder, broker, the mayor of Idaho Falls. She referred me to lots of people. Um, uh, this, this one's very, this is a broker. This is a uh, civil engineer. Civil engineers are extremely important. Uh, builder, uh, lender, architect, uh, influencer. Influencers are very important in new markets because they refer you to other people and then driving back. So I was home at 10.59 on the second day, having gotten up at 4 a.m. on Monday so I could get to Idaho Falls by one o'clock. But that's what the, the visits look like. You find these people, once you know what the mix is, and I just gave it to you, those people you find just on, off of Google and you have phone conversations. So I, I usually have 30 phone conversations and then a two day visit. And the people that I talk to, uh, that I actually physically see are the distillations of those 30 conversations. The 12 people that I care about the most, I go see them. Now, value add is very similar, but obviously there's more property tours. Does that answer uh, the question? Great. All right, so let me put this back up so you guys can, whoops, there we go. And by the way, another way to connect with me is Multifamily University. We do 20 very data-driven webinars. So as you can tell, we are geeks and nerds. And so we collect other geeks and nerds. And so people that are very geeky and very specific in their data-driven style present on our platform. So we do 20 webinars a year. In fact, we have 1,250 people signed up for a webinar that's tomorrow. So you might wanna check it out at multifamilyu.com. And I'll go back to the previous page and I'll keep answering questions. So there we go, on the right. So let's see, I'm gonna scroll up because there were some questions before. Uh, B and C. There, okay, there was a question about if California will be a better state to invest in and when that would be. Uh, in, in about 20 years. California will boom in 20 years because of climate change. Keep in mind, places like Phoenix will have extraordinary effects in 20 years. I don't think there's any of you 
that are looking at a time horizon that long. So I would suggest you completely stay away from California. What does boots on the ground look like for tertiary markets? One of the things that you should consider doing is that when you go to tertiary markets, you should find a local partner. When I do new construction, I don't find partners. I just hire what is known as an owner's rep. New construction is a much more structured industry. So I just find owner's reps and there's plenty of those available. They're project managers with construction degrees. And they basically visit the property every two to three times a week for me. When I do value add, definitely need a partner. And my preferred partner usually is a property manager. So I give them equity. And that fixes the problem. Um, it's nice that Ruben Greth is here because I did a podcast for him recently. Mm -hmm. Yes, Clayton, that was me. All right. Um, Philippe has a question as what is your forecast regarding cap rates going forward? Um, I believe that there's going to be some cap rate compression that will occur. I don't expect it to occur for at least another six to nine months. After that, I expect there to be cap rate compressions if interest rates stay low. So in six months, if interest rates go up, which I'm not predicting, then I think cap rates will stay about the same. If they stay low, which I am predicting, then you should see some cap rate compression happening. It's going to be uh, more sporadic. In the past, cap rate compression was everywhere. Every market had cap rate compression. We're now at the point where some markets will continue to compress and others won't. I think the markets with, um, with uh, job growth, or let's call it post-COVID job growth, with you know, jobs moving from places like San Francisco, those are the markets that are going to see a continued cap rate compression. Sure. Um, I'll take this one. I, I find this interesting. College Station, Texas. So interesting market. I've looked at it. This is a college town. Is there anything else driving growth? The answer is no, not really. It is a, it's, it's kind of a one trick pony. But I think that towns like College Town will do well in a post COVID environment. So I, I'm more likely to recommend College Station today than nine months ago. And then Jim, Jim Big says, are we already in a recession and how long, uh, how long will it last? And what, what effect will it have it on multifamily this cycle? Absolutely, we're in a recession. The Federal Reserve doesn't think that we're in a recession because the way that the Fed defines a recession is a truly awful way of looking at it. According to them, if the US economy grew in the last quarter, we are out of a recession. Well, normally that makes sense and it made sense for the last 100 years. But what if the quarter before that, you, your GDP had declined 33%? It goes up 13%. Is that growth? Aren't you still 20% in the hole? Well, until we get back to the size of the US economy being the size that we had in Feb, until that time, hell yeah, we're in a recession. We're still at 7% unemployment. And that number is bogus because a bunch of states are not counting people that have been unemployed for more than 6%, 66 months. They're not counting them. I mean, what is the point of dropping the unemployment number by simply dropping the unemployed? That's nonsense. Our true unemployment rate is somewhere in the nine and a half percent range. No economy is going to come out of a recession if that rate doesn't decline. And obviously it's now going to increase. So in Jan and Feb, we're, December, Jan and Feb, we're gonna see an increase in unemployment. California just shut down, that's 40 million people. Other states are also shutting down. So we're gonna see an increase in unemployment. So we are absolutely in a recession. Well, I would, uh, we could probably be here all day uh, asking you questions. I, uh, I wanna thank you so, so much for your generous information and sharing. Everybody has gotten such a good amount of information today. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I so appreciate your time. And really look forward to learning more from you. And, you know, that boot camp is one that I, I always recommend. So thank you so much for uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Thanks so much. At